So my name is Jim Walker. I'm one of the directors here at Walk 21. Um, and this is our 10th and uh, at the moment, our last in the series of uh, interviewing people working in national governments who are going to give us a bit of an insight into the process that, uh, of how to develop a walking policy. Um, we're delighted that Kevin Golding Williams is, is with us today. He's from the UK government. Um, and when we say UK, you might have to explain this, but this is effectively we're talking about England today, uh, which is where 85% of the population live uh, in the UK. And this, um, his particular experience, I think, is going to be very interesting because you're in the second version of a, of a national policy um, for England. And uh, you've actually gone beyond policy and actually thinking about delivery. You're very keen on that delivery step. And I think this will be particularly interesting for countries who maybe have got a policy and are trying to work out how much money to allocate it or how it's actually going to get delivered. So we're particularly insight in, interested in your insights today. Um, the idea of this series is really to just give people some, not just uh, explanations of how it's working, or, or maybe sometimes it isn't working uh, in government, but, but to try and inspire people who haven't maybe got started yet uh, to really uh, imagine that it's maybe not so difficult and, uh, and to learn from each other. So we're, we're going to talk for about an hour. If the people who have joined the call, thank you for joining. If you've got things that you'd like to ask Kevin, uh, pop them in the chat and I'll try and include them in the conversation that we have uh, over the next uh, 50, 55 minutes or so. Okay, let's get going. Kevin, uh, thank you very much. Now, you're quite unique in, in working for national government, but you were originally actually uh, working at Living Streets, which is the, the main walking advocacy organization. So you've gone from being inside the NGO to actually being inside government. Can you just maybe just explain how that worked and uh, who actually pays you at the moment? Are, are you working for Living Street still or are you, are you technically uh, a government employee? Yeah, no, thanks, Jim. And yeah, good, good, good to see you all on the call, on the call uh, this afternoon. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's an interesting background because my sort of background is, I suppose, in the third sector or, or what you'd call the charitable sector, if you like. Um, so, as you say, previously, I worked at Living Streets, uh, where I was the head of public affairs for about five years, if I, if I remember rightly. Um, and basically, uh, a few years after uh, I joined, um, we, we, we had a really good relationship with the Department for Transport. They were very open about secondments, actually bo bo going both ways, which actually in itself is a really interesting approach that colleagues might like to consider because you get the experience of colleagues in government going out to see life in the charitable or third sector. Uh, and likewise, you get the input of ideas from the third sector as well. And equally that applies to local authorities and councils and stuff like that as well. And so basically I was asked to uh, go on secondment to the active travel team within the Department for Transport, uh, originally to just help build up their sort of capabilities around understanding walking. Um, there had been quite a bit of history, I suppose, around sort of a focus on cycling or, or a perceived focus on cycling um, and, and really they wanted some sort of help and assistance around sort of broadening that message if you like on walking. Now it just coincided uh, that as I joined the department there was uh, a piece of legislation going through called the Infrastructure Act which funnily enough is something that I've been working at uh, and on when I was uh, at Living Streets basically and taking it through Parliament. And basically within this piece of legislation, it set a requirement for government and by government, as you say, Jim, we're talking about in England here, even though it's a UK government, um, to, to establish a cycling and walking investment strategy, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, but essentially that coincided with my arrival. And so essentially I was asked to then lead the development of that strategy. 
And then fast forward a few years, basically, my, my secondment ended up being <laughs> increased to three years in the end, which, which is quite a long time for a secondment. Uh, I think by the end, people were like, is this really a secondment still? Um, and, and, and once again, sort of serendipity just came into play in that uh, the, the, someone that I was working with, who was the head of the cycling and walking policy team, just happened to be moving on to a new role. I was invited to apply, but in an open competition way, basically. So I was against everyone else competing. And, and basically, I was fortunate enough to be given the job. So probably about three and a half, four years ago, you get the little things from LinkedIn, which tell you how long you've been at an organization. Uh, I, I became a real civil servant. Uh, okay, so you've, of, crossed, you've crossed over officially. Since. You've That's crossed over it. officially. Yeah, officially crossed huh? over. I'm interested in this. Uh, it's very interesting. There's a there's a comment we've already had about this sort of th this relationship between walking and cycling, and how so often uh, it can mean that um, a lot of the money, a lot of the attention, uh, a lot of the conversation can go to cycling. Um, you you aren't an engineer. You're not a planner so much. You're you're working in public affairs, weren't you? What, what was but they were trying to address that balance. So what was it that they asked you to do? Was it sort of just stick up the hand and sort of make sure walking wasn't forgotten in, in these conversations, in the policy development? Or was it more than that? Yeah, I, I think at that time that I joined, which was sort of around 2014, 15, we were, we were coming off the back of um, the then Prime Minister, David Cameron's, uh, had just made an announcement about like a cycling revolution, which was coming back of the, uh, the Olympic Games of 2012 as well. So there was a lot of funding going directly into cycle infrastructure. And, and, and what, you, what you saw sort of being used was almost a term of cycle proofing. So essentially, this was cycle proofing um, any new sort of investments into roads to ensure that it was it was good for for cycling. But at the same time, there was a concern that walking was being marginalised. So in a way, I suppose my role there was almost walk, walking proofing the cycle proofing, basically, okay. to make sure that walking isn't forgotten. And, and in particular, that thing about the and walking bit basically, which is kind of where um, I think in England, we, we've had a real change now where it is sort of much more about walking and cycling. In fact, walking, wheeling and cycling is what we talk about now, rather than I think the classic cycling and walking as it used to be. It, it's, it's taken quite a long time, hasn't it, for that to, to happen? I mean, you mentioned about the strategy. Um, it's interesting that you were probably the ones campaigning to say, don't forget, and walking. And then suddenly you're, you're bought on the inside and say, OK, then then do it. We've heard that in New York. You know, they uh, the people who were campaigning for change ended up being hired by the mayor to actually deliver the sort of summer streets program and many of the things that they ended up doing uh, so effectively across New York. So, so it's not an unusual idea, but I, I, I like it all the same. The first strategy that England did come up with was actually called a uh, gear change, I think. I mean, very focused on on cycling. Um, were you there at that time? You, you know, did it, it was it basically taking you a bit of time to get get heard to get that yeah. walking message in there? What, what was what did you think? So probably it's, it's probably worth disentangling a few things there, actually, just in terms of how gear change sits against the SeaWiz, if you like, essentially. So probably go, going back to about 2013, uh, and this is interesting because I know some of the other talks have sort of flagged this before, as well, that there was a um, plan for a, for a national cycling plan or, or some, something like that. I can't exactly remember the detail. It was very much just cycling, wasn't walking at all. Um, and essentially where we had a change of administration uh, from, the, from the coalition in 2015, that plan was dropped. Uh, but we had this requirement in the Infrastructure Act to set a cycling and walking investment strategy. Now that does two things. One thing is that it requires you to set the total funding envelope for, um, for walking and cycling over a set period of government, which in the UK government, we talk about a spending review, which is about five years. It also requires you to set some objectives. So basically, you know, how much more walking is there gonna be? How much more cycling is there gonna be? Which groups are gonna be walking more? 
as well. And broadly speaking, our objectives were around increasing walking, increasing cycling and increasing walk to school. Now, the first uh, CWIS, so the first cycling and walking investment strategy, uh, I'll, I'll say CWIS because it's just much quicker. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the I'm glad you CWIS, explained it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I thought I'd explain it early on. So the first CWIS, CWIS 1, was published in 2017. Uh, and that was running up to uh, the period 2021. The plan was then to have CWIS 2 come in in 2020 and run through to 2025. But there were a few things that got in the way of it, uh, namely a pandemic and uh, a general election as well. But as, as we all know, you know, that's that's life basically. So we, we yeah. kind of deal with it as you like. So, so essentially we had CWIS 1, uh, that total investment we originally estimated at the beginning was 1.2 billion. It ended up being just over 3 billion. We're going to do some more work to evaluate how much of that, you know, sort of went in and the quality of what went in there as well. For CWIS 2, our estimate is that it's over 3 billion uh, at the moment, um, but we're going to publish a revised estimate uh, in a formal uh, report to Parliament that we have to produce every couple of years. So the next one of those will be alongside CWIS 3 in 2025. Now, you also mentioned gear change, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing. So the, the strategies have always been there. But in 2020, the then Prime Minister Johnson um, announced a uh, essentially a, a cycling and walking plan, which was very much delivery based rather than strategy based. And it was very much it. I think it had something like sort of 30 or 40 actions and commitments. Uh, and also alongside it was two billion pounds worth of investment. Now, the two billion pounds worth of investment is included in CWIS 2. All of the actions that came off the back of that are kind of have either been delivered or are kind of on go being delivered by Active Travel England as well. So that's where it gets a little bit confusing. And, and, and some of the ambitions that were contained within the gear change cycling and walking plan we then ended up uh, sort of encapsulating within CWIS 2. So if you like, CWIS 2 builds on CWIS 1, but also takes some of the things away from gear change as well. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so so we've got this overarching policy. And just, just to sort of understand how this might have happened, because you've mentioned uh, several prime ministers, we, we, we've, got, we've had a good number uh, in the UK recently, uh, as you say. Um, was it basically prime ministerial led? You know, did it come from the top? You know, was it was that the ambition? And 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 suddenly everything got moving. And these big numbers you're talking about, did that literally come from the prime minister's office? Yeah. So 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 literally for for, for CWIS one, um, you know, as I mentioned, we had about one point two billion. That this is across government funding, as as I think I've mentioned previously. The the actual dedicated funding for for walking and cycling was actually fairly modest. It was I, I think at the time we we had a program. Uh, the Cycling City Fund, which was just over a hundred million pounds or something like that, and then we had various other behaviour change funds as well. Um, uh, and then, yeah, basically in 2020, when gear change was announced, uh, and as you say, we, we we had a new prime minister in who had already, you know, had done quite a lot in London as the mayor of London. If if you didn't know, he used to be the mayor of London, so I'd done quite a lot of work there. Um, he was known and, for the Boris bike, wasn't he? So he would already got it, a sort of reputation for that. It. That's exactly yeah. it. And, and cycle superhighways and stuff like that as well. And so essentially, you know, that, that was then brought into, into central government. And essentially, yeah, it came direct from number 10 um, to develop. This, is, this was very much, you know, sort of um, led by the PM, but obviously a government plan with associated sort of funding as well. And as you say, you know, sort of two billion pounds into active travel um, is, is certainly the highest that I'm aware of in terms of, you know, sort of funding for, for England uh, historically as well. And so essentially, as, as of the latest figures, um, around 850 million has been invested 
uh, today. Obviously, there's all sorts of challenges going on with spend in terms of inflationary pressures. So there's a lot of capital projects that are now increasingly being delayed because they're having to be sort of rethought out in terms of costings and stuff like that, which which everyone else is no doubt aware of uh, globally uh, as well because of the times we're living in. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting point. So you've got prime ministerial leadership. You quickly come up with um, a document. Um, you've you've almost straight away gone into a sort of investment strategy. You know, it's a document all about delivery. And uh, with those sorts of numbers, probably the largest in the world, let alone the largest ever in England, um, it, you've, you've had to set up a new organization effectively to be able to roll it out the door. And it's quite interesting um, how this you've differentiated the difference between policy or, and delivery. Um, and this is the role of the new agency, isn't it? Could you tell us a little bit about this Active Travel England then? Uh, how, how easy has it been to set up a, a new agency to actually roll, roll out all these big ideas and actually spend the money? Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, I mean, certainly it's been something that I think we've spoken about for a number of years with our stakeholders, you know, about how great it would be, you know, if you could have a body that could, you know, go out there and actually sort of work with councils to do delivery. Because, of course, you know, when you're working in central government with the best will in the world, there are only so many people. And as much as, you know, it's great to go out and talk about individual schemes you simply can't get down to the level of detail in the same way that you can as if you've got a delivery body. So for example, in uh, in England, we have national highways who manage our strategic road network. So, you know, they, they do you know, they do really good work locally because they, they, they have 3000 odd people and stuff, which, which, which is fine. Um, so one of the main things that was contained within Gear Change was a proposal to establish a new executive agency for active travel. Uh, essentially, it'd do three things. One would be that it would oversee program delivery funding. So essentially that function would still be overseen by government naturally, because that has to happen, but they would have responsibility for the delivery, both of capital and uh, revenue programs. So that's actually the infrastructure and the behavior change side of it as well. The second bit was basically about ensuring that uh, funding was going to high quality schemes. So that's basically ensuring that where investment is going in, you know, both the walking infrastructure and the cycle infrastructure is being delivered to a high standard. And of course, that's not just about going in with a clipboard and saying, well, is that what we expect? It's all about raising capability and capacity within local authorities and councils so that people feel empowered that they can do that and Active Travel England is supporting them to do that. So that is kind of the second leg, if you like. And, and the third and actually probably most important Fine. in some respects leg is around uh, planning. So basically as of actually just under one month's time, uh, Active Travel England will become a statutory consultee in the planning system in England. Um, and so that means, you know, for new developments, they will be offering views and providing advice and support for local authorities uh, once again. So really transformative. Um, there's eventually be around 100 people working at Active Travel England. Uh, and, and since they were sort of, I suppose, formally established, you can you can pick a date as to when they became formally established on all sorts of measures. But essentially, it's kind of been, you know, almost a year ish. But essentially, they're up to about 70 percent of their team being in place now. And so, you know, they're already providing advice to local authorities about planning matters, um, about designing infrastructure uh, and about delivery as well. So it's so a really transformative change there. Interesting. So basically, these are experts. You know, you're, you're actually hiring people who are like designers, engineers, planners, uh, bringing them in to actually get into the detail and make sure, like you say, people are doing a good job. Is it easy to find these sorts of people? And, and do they want to come and work around walking and cycling? I mean, very often people aren't trained very much in these issues. If you're a designer, you're a planner, you're an engineer, they might not have much time uh, learning about these things. So how, how easy has it been recruiting people uh, and, and making them think that this is the best thing for their career? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, it's a really interesting one because certainly I, I think it speaks to a bigger problem that, that we've got, particularly, I think, in, 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 the, in the UK um, and perhaps actually globally as well, which is basically, you know, how do we ensure that we're getting the next generation of engineers and designers to see active travel as a career choice rather than a stepping stone? to wider engineering projects. Um, pleasingly, actually, I mean, the, the, the response and uptake has been, been amazing, actually. I, th I think uh, some, some of, you know, where I've spoken to, to colleagues on the Active Travel England side who have joined are just like, oh my God, this is, this is my dream job. I never thought the day would come, <laughs> uh, you know, where, where I can work as, as an engineer and I'm applying this to Active Travel. But but certainly there and, and this is one of the things that, you know, Active Travel England will be considering, which is, you know, how, how do you increase the pool of experts so that essentially you're not cannibalizing from other organizations? So Active Travel England has attracted people from actually, you know, consultancy in the private sector but also from local authorities as well. And so, you know, where do the local authorities and councils then get people to replace them? Um, and, and so at the moment, I feel probably the pool of people is too small. And actually one of the big things actually in the legacy, if you like, of AT moving forwards is actually how, how do you create a sort of uh, a more diverse and bigger sort of skilled pop population, whether it's engineering, whether it's planners, whether it's program delivery, whether it's project design, so on and so forth, that, that can do all of this work around active travel. Absolutely. And coming back to the point we, we talked about earlier, you, you know, I can say this to you because you come from walking, but I mean, a lot of people must be coming from cycling. I mean, that they are, we know again, all over the world, people often have, have become cycling officers and then they've been told, add walking, it, you know, can you just address this whole thing about the balance in the plan and, and the funding? Do you split the money out for walking and cycling? Do you split out the experts for walking and for cycling? Do you split out the schemes for walking and for cycling? Or, or is it a hotspot? You know, I, it's quite interesting, this. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a really interesting one. And certainly coming from, you know, my Living Streets background, it's something that I'm, I'm really interested in. I, I, I think sort of at the at the top level, and this is something that I always remember. I um uh, I, I did a radio interview. So for, so for international colleagues, as uh, we have a national radio station called BBC Radio Two, uh, and we have a chap called Jeremy Vine, who's very well known for cycling, but he's also a very well known DJ and, and broadcaster as well. Um, and I, when I was at Living Streets, I was asked to go on his show. Um, uh, with a colleague, actually, or someone who'd recently left Living Streets to join a cycling organisation. And I think what they were hoping was that we were going to get together and then have a bit of an argument about, you know, how walking and cycling was so different. And actually, you know, what we said was actually, you know, walking and cycling is 95% the same sort of thing that we're trying to get. It's the 5% difference which is crucial. And it's, it's a really big 5% difference because there's some fundamental differences in there. But essentially, we're trying to do the same sort of thing, which is enabling more people to, to travel actively, basically, with all the other associated benefits as well. So, so what we've sort of been doing, if you like, ever since we've had the cycling and walking investment strategy is also working with local authorities to develop their local cycling and walking infrastructure plans, which also has a snappy acronym, as you would expect, of LSWIPS. Um, and, and essentially, this asks local authorities to outline where investment should go on walking and cycling. And, and if you like that, that's the key thing with the CWIS, that it is talking about walking and cycling. It isn't just talking about cycling. Now, now on, the, on the issue of funding, it's a really tricky one. Um, certainly, uh, when we've looked at this in the past to try and tease out where the funding goes to, I'd probably say actually the majority of funding, so that three billion figure that I mentioned, I'd say probably the majority of that goes on what you would consider as walking infrastructure in particular public realm improvements. So this is in, you know, if you're improving a town centre or a city centre to make it more attractive to walking, uh, footways, upgrades and stuff like that. 
However, what you do tend to see is that where um, where you see transformative investment, i.e. something wasn't there before, that's the impact the cycle for infrastructure funding has. So in the UK in particular and in England, where you're seeing segregated cycle infrastructure being put on. I mean, thankfully, we, we, you know, in the UK, we, we, we're in a position where actually, you know, most places, not all, and I'm not suggesting that everywhere has footways, but the vast majority of places have footways. So actually, it's more of a maintenance and renewal issue rather than putting in the infrastructure and in, in the first place. Now, yeah, when you try that's... and break break down the figures, it's really, really tricky because, you know, um, you know, a, a, a paving slab is a paving slab. So that's walking. So that can go in that column. Uh, a segregated cycleway. Well, the segregated cycleway bit, that's that's clearly cycling. However, you then have, well, what about the lighting columns? What about the drainage, which which impacts on everything? So so to be honest, what what we've tended to do is actually just bring them together. We, we, we've tried to work out ways where you can disaggregate the funding, but at a scheme level, it's it's really difficult, actually, to be honest, even to draw out the bits which are walking and cycling within wider public transport or highway schemes to say how much of that project is actually active travel. To then disaggregate that again to the level of cycling and walking you, you, you start getting into the sort of realms of complicated. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but interestingly, and, and one of the questions we've got here from Tamara uh, on the call it is about how we do actually assess, you know, what's required and particularly retrofitting in existing street environments, you know, what the tools that are available, either you've created or maybe at a local level, it, you know, the, this is when it actually comes down to getting rid of the money, um, it, it can be difficult, can't it? And um, I'm aware that in the UK, you've spent some some um, some interesting energy. I think just recently thinking about the appraisal methodology. And I know this is a detail, um, but if you forgive us uh, for indulging it for, for a second, what you do seem to do is you've gone away from that imagining that it's all about time savings, which is traditionally how a lot of transport schemes get evaluated. Uh, and you've, you're not necessarily talking about time quality. I mean, that would be the dream. But you are talking about you are valuing safety, you're valuing equity, gender inclusion, um, you know, new variables and also cl climate. There's a, there's a carbon uh, value in there as well, I believe, in your appraisal scheme. How do you actually how do you put numbers on these schemes? And, and to answer Tamara's question about um, using the right tools. You know, how do you actually apply a sort of carbon saving or health benefit into a into a right? We're going to do this street here and this is how we're going to spend our money. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, yeah, Tamara, your points there are really good ones about sort of disaggregated <laughs> budgets as well, actually. And, and and to be honest, actually, I mean, this is this is sort of a, a slight aside just to begin with. But it'd be interesting to see what, what others think as well is one of the biggest challenges that we've had is that um, unlike, say, the rail network or the highway network, we, we don't have any definitive figures for total lengths of either um, walking infrastructure or cycling infrastructure, which means that makes it really, really difficult when you're considering investment in maintenance and stuff like that, because you might have one council that uh, you know knows everything that it's controlling. You may have another one that doesn't, which, which makes it quite difficult when you're sort of con considering investment. And certainly one of the things that um, Active Travel England is doing, and once again, this is the joy of having such a big organization and one bit actually that I did miss out was actually it's developing quite a big data and analytical function um, which is exactly addressing that point so they're uh, developing a, a, a kind of model if you like a map of actually as active travel infrastructure is being sort of developed starting to map that in sort of various sort of exciting ways um, so that we do start having sort of indicators well how much is is kind of actually out there so much of it at the moment though comes back down to um, asking that local authorities put forward proposals that are outlined in their local cycling and walking infrastructure plans and I suppose that was I suppose the tipping point for 
you know, enabling local authorities to take a longer term view as to actually, you know, it'd be great if there was unlimited funds, but unfortunately there's there's not for any of us. So so You've actually got more than most. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's good. Um, but where I'm, I'm glad I'm glad the way you're still ambitious, you still want more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, always. Um, you know, where where is the priority investment, you know, for for local authorities? And of course, it'd be different depending on where you are, because it's all about that sort of place based uh, function, if you like, for places on, on the evaluation side or not the evaluation on the modeling side. I think that's a really interesting question, actually, because um, we, we have, as you say, transport appraisal guidance over the over the last eight years. There's been a real sort of change in how um, uh, the impacts and understanding the uh, uh, con uh, cost benefit ratios, if you like, and, and stuff like that um, are calculated. So BCRs. Um, and there's still work ongoing, and I don't, and I think that would be a continued thing. Actually, we know there are, you know, for example, problems in trying to calculate um, the the health impacts for children, which at the moment aren't aren't, aren't picked up for for a variety of <laughs> very complicated reasons. Um, but certainly on carbon, that's increasingly being reflected, and there is a very live conversation about that. Last year, the department uh, here. The UK government, there were bits that applied specifically to England, but it also applied to the UK more widely as well, uh, published its transport decarbonisation plan, which sort of outlined how the UK plans to decarbonise the transport system. Now, you can only do that if you have a good understanding about where your savings are in terms of carbon. And, and I think there's a very live debate about, well, actually, how many, how much carbon savings can walking and cycling actually deliver? Because of course, it's all predicated on other interventions within the transport system as well. The health one is really, really interesting. In fact, this morning I was at a meeting with uh, the chief medical officer here in England, uh, Chris Whitty and uh, the health secretary. And, and that's one of the things that actually we were talking about, actually, how can we work sort of closer together um, to reflect, you know, the benefits of increased active travel, you know, for both mental and physical health. And uh, we've been running a program for, for just over a year now, which is uh, an active travel social uh, prescription pilots program, which is starting to test some of these things. First time it's been done in England. I know it has been uh, done in some of our, our, our other sort of uh, our colleagues' nations, um, but the yeah, first time in England, Scotland so owned it, haven't they? That's yeah. it, that's it. So yeah. it's very much a kind of test and learn approach um, to then build up, you know, the next stage of that as well. So I think on all of these things, you know, it, it never stops basically, which is a good thing um, because yeah. your yeah. models get better, you get more evidence. As you get more evidence, your model improves and, and you kind of just get that sort of circular increase, if you like. Yeah, you, you talked about the chief medical officer and actually come back to the, the structure of, of um, the Active Travel England, you've got an advisory panel there that includes the chief medical officer, you've got a regional mayor on there, you've got consultants from Arabs, I think, on there, you've got, um, yeah, experts, I guess, but but high level, you've, you've gone, uh, and in fact, the chair of the, or the, what you call the commissioner for Active Travel England is a, is a gold medal winner for cycling, you know, Chris Boardman, you know, internationally famous, I guess, for, for his role in, in not just um, talking about these things, but, you know, getting medals for it. How, what was that decision to sort of try and get that high level team? Is that useful to you that you can have these conversations? And are you really using that to influence government beyond the actual agency itself? Yeah, I, I, I think certainly my, my, my approach when we were developing the, the CWIS 1, if you like, was around that actually the only way you're going to do this is by working across government because you've got the Department for Transport and then within it, you've got active travel. But of course, the world of active travel reaches far beyond the Department for Transport. We, 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 have, a, um, we, we have a government department that kind of works with, with local authorities. We have a government department that deals with health. Uh, and we have another government department that deals with education uh, and another one which deals with sport. And, and you can immediately see, you need to be having conversations with all of these people because they're going to be developing funding programs and policies which will impact on your ability to deliver 
you know, outcomes, basically, whatever they are, um, for active travel. So, so that's been our guiding light, if you like, for, for probably about the last eight years. So it means that probably we're, we're one of the best plugged in teams uh, across uh, government, basically, because we're, because we're continuing to sort of work with colleagues across government to understand new funding streams and how we can assist and, and everything else. And so, as well. and so when you talk to someone from the Department of Education or the Chief Medical Officer, it, it doesn't take too much persuasion to get them to sort of be involved and uh, no, you know, no. they get it? Yeah, I, I, and, and, I, and I think once again, I, th I think that's kind of a reflection of having a statutory strategy, because that is something that has to be done, which that makes life a lot easier if you've got something which, you know, is legally required. But I think also where that's just been in place now for eight years, um, you, you build those relationships. So, so, so when you're talking about, you know, the second cycling and walking investment strategy, people know what you're talking about. Now, now of course, obviously, there, as you say, you know, going back to 2020 and the time of the pandemic, you know, huge increase in investment. There was a huge increase in people walking and cycling for, for exercise. Um, I, I don't know what it's like elsewhere around the planet for our colleagues, but certainly in England, you know, I think we were allowed out once a day, if I remember rightly. So, so all of a sudden, you know, actually, you know, walking and cycling was, well, pretty much the only thing you could do actually you know in terms of exercise so you saw that sort of real big sort of cultural shift um and i think to be honest with active travel england bringing in that high level advisory panel as you say you know chief medical officer uh you know the mayor of birmingham that that's to kind of you know put, put in those sort of strategic links both both across government but also across some of the other major bits, I suppose, of the devolved landscape in, in England, because increasingly, like some other European countries already have, uh, we're, we're currently moving to, to an increasingly devolved approach to funding, where, where our major cities are given pots of funding, and then they decide how that funding is spent, rather than central government. I guess, I mean, realistically it's because you've got three billion pounds isn't it that everyone wants to be your friend or you know would it would it be the same if you didn't have the money do you think people would still get it that's that's a really interesting question actually because on on, on the one hand we've we've obviously got the dedicated funding as you say you know of the two billion that that was announced so obviously lots of people keen to sort of get involved in that but actually, for um, the CWIS two period, um, the I think we've estimated it's around three point four billion from across government. So, so actually, when you break down the funding, about one point four billion is actually from other government departments. It's not from us, and predominantly the reason why there's so much funding is because it's devolved to local authorities to decide what to spend it on. And because we've been doing work with local authorities, you know, to say, you know, let put forward active travel sort of proposals, it then means that in terms of the bids that are then coming into other government departments, we're seeing a lot, you know, which is around active travel, basically. Yeah, it, but we've got a question here about these local plans, um, you know, and. And often they're bringing in consultants, these local authorities, to write these plans to make sure that they do hit the right quality. You've set the agenda, you've got some budget, but they have to, as you say, hit a certain quality standard. Even in the, 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 uh, the authority where I live, the plan was rejected, even though it was uh, you know, trying to do the right thing. Uh, it didn't hit the quality mark. How, how, we, how easy is it for authorities to actually meet the standard are you being too strict or, or or are they just being too slack in in not knowing really what to do or ha what to apply for yeah i i think it kind of goes back to actually that thing around sort of you know i suppose local authority and council sort of you know capability and capacity i mean number one we know that particularly in england and i expect this is elsewhere as well colleagues can agree with this you know increasingly councils and local authorities are asked to deliver more and more for less and less uh particularly in the uk with an aging population and 
you know issues of social care and stuff which which are huge huge challenges if you like um so there's a big question there around you know how do you increase the sort of skills and capability of local authorities um rather than as you say just sort of saying sorry this isn't this isn't good enough, which doesn't help anyone. And, and I think actually, in a way, with Active Travel England being established, you know, over probably the next five years, one of the big things will be increasing the capability sort of across the sector. Um, obviously, there will always be a place, you know, it's a, it's a whole mix of sort of, you know, public private working and that works across a number of ways but 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 what you really want is actually sort of you know councils to be in a place where they've got their own experts obviously bringing others to help you which we all do from time to time but actually then ensure that there's actually people there who can then carry on delivering it after that works been delivered and, and i think all that comes back down to the capacity and capability and and i suppose it's a need actually to I, I always speak about the idea of developing a skills framework for active travel. So, you know, if we want people to work in the world of active travel, what, what are the range of skills that are needed, whether you're a designer, whether you're an engineer? And you think of about it in that sort of strategic way rather than, oh, we need to deliver some active travel infrastructure. Who's going to do it? You kind of set the agenda, if you like, and that starts getting you into conversations about education, and skills and, and everything else as well. Yeah, I remember uh, back at Department of Transport, well, probably 15 years ago now, we did a skills audit and re recognized that actually in most of the universities weren't teaching these things at the time. Yeah. Um, and so there was gonna be a 10 year lag, but it sounds like you, you've kept that on the agenda to actually develop courses, make sure that these things are being taught better. Is that, is that part of the future plans for, this sort of capacity building in, in the way forwards for England? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I mean, we, we have a number of uh, expert groups where we uh, where we have people, you know, sort of at, at universities as well, um, where they talk about, you know, the courses that they're developing and, and also working with some of the chartered institutions as well. Okay. So, you know, where, where, when you graduate in, in whatever, you might join a chartered institution um, and you have to do continuing professional development in order to then get your status as, you know, an engineer or an architect or, or whatever. And, and actually, what is the role of chartered institutions? in developing those skills as well you know there's some stuff out there already which is great stuff actually but you know how can active travel england kind of set the agenda if you like for that which once yeah. again is a positive of having that exec agency it, it sounds very progressive I, i'm sure it is progressive you've done you've achieved a lot you know and a uh, lot of good words written down a lot of commitments a lot of structures around advisory panels i think you've got an infrastructure group you've got a cross-government delivery team you've got a multi-agency advisory group i mean quite a lot of structures that you're building into this system to be to, to keep its robustness and yet your funding is only five years it's reviewed every five years um you've been through several prime ministers the one who started all this uh the boris spike uh guy has gone um you, you've had to cope with change you know you've mentioned the pandemic but you've You've had to cope with political leadership change as well. Um, and some of that has resulted in, in a budget cut, hasn't it? I mean, how do you deal with the realism of these things and any advice to other people about how, how, that, how, how you'd live with these, sort of, these ups and downs, political changes, budgets suddenly being cut in half? Yeah, no, no. And, and of course, you know, that's 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 part of, you know, be, being a you know a civil servant in, in any government administration, you know, anywhere in the world, you know, in, you know, good, good functional, you know, democracies, you know, ha have changes. And of course, it means that one day you may be following one thing and then the next day you might be following something else. I, I, I suppose probably there's a couple of things that come to mind. The, the, the first one was um, probably the, the actual having the statutory basis for the cycling and walking investment strategy. Has, yeah, so that has goes beyond of, the five years. Yeah. That goes beyond the five years. And, and essentially, because that's legally required and it also received cross-party support when it went through as well, means that everyone kind of agrees with 
the concept. Okay. So yeah. so we've had SeaWiz one, we're into SeaWiz two, we're gonna have our next spending event, which is called a spending review in the UK, uh, probably next year. I say probably because we're due a general election, which I think has to take place by the end of next year. Um, so there, there will be a new administration, you know, of, of whatever color um, after that general election. And, and of course, as you say, you know, we, we, we then have all the workings around, you know, government departments bidding for funding for the next five year period. Um, and, and I think once again, this is where Active Travel England and, and having local authorities developing their local cycling and walking in infrastructure plans. What, what that means is that we we have a pipeline of projects from local mm. authorities which means that you know w when we're in a spending review environment you can say these are the projects you know uh that that, that we're looking to fund and this is how much it's going to cost we also have some objectives that we've outlined in seawiz 2 that will actually be included in the seawiz 3 period so for example we have an objective that 50 percent of journeys um in towns and cities uh, and worth saying that does include rural towns as well it's not just urban um by 2030 so of course that will need funding towards it and within the transport decarbonization plan we had a commitment to deliver a world-class um walking and cycling infrastructure by 2040 as well so once again that will need investment in it as well so so there's lots of sort of very strategic objectives if you like that go beyond the current 2025 out to 2030 that 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 will need funding but but as it you gives say it more you know, certainty yeah. yeah yeah that's it as as much as you can do you know for, for for any policy world and and of course you know with with funding as um colleagues may or may not know uh we we, we had a few changes in government at the end of last year we, we had a big autumn statement made by our chancellor uh government departments, you know, had to live within their means. And of course, as everyone knows, um, you know, inflation has gone through the roof. So typically from what I'm seeing, not just on active travel, actually, but on rail projects and road projects, you know, you're looking at inflationary increases of anything up to 13 or 14 percent. But you're having yeah. to manage that within existing budgets. And, and of course, you know, decisions have to be made, yeah, yeah, which means that there has yeah. been some reductions in capital funding um, over the next couple of years. Uh, and how you fit in with with rail, with uh, motorways, with autonomous vehicles, with electrification, you know, in the bigger mix? Do, are you still tiny despite all this budget and all these influences or do you feel as though there's more equity now now that you've got active traveling then has that helped create a sort of more visible footprint i suppose for for active travel inside the way that the department works the way the government works yeah i i think probably historically people like colleagues from across the department you know whether it's in rail whether it's in the strategic roads uh, or, or wherever else have, have always worked with us and that that's been fantastic I, I think the big difference is with active travel england uh, it, it's it's having you know a dedicated organization around active travel so for example um there's now quite a lot of work going on between national highways and Active Travel England, the sister organisations, uh, around how they can work together around scheme design uh, 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 sort of very early in the process, which, you know, we're, we're, with the best will in the world, when you're a small policy and funding team within a government department, you, 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 there's simply not enough time in the day uh, to have those sort of conversations. Mm -hmm. Whereas once you've got, you know, an inspectorate team and a planning team that can sit down with a local authority representatives from national highways as well and talk in great detail about a very specific scheme and about how active travel um how the active travel needs of that scheme can be improved or how can the design change you can immediately see how all of a sudden you're going to unlock sort of you know better outcomes if you like and and hearing about you know our, the other nations you know within the united kingdom you know, in Wales made the headlines recently as sort of deciding to cancel a lot of road improvement schemes as because it was conflicting with its carbon objectives. And Scotland, very proactive, one of the first in the world to have a walking strategy, of course. Um, 
and uh, we've interviewed them separately on this because they they did so much for walking and about to do a new walking strategy this interrelationship between between places and and also between sort of you know big ticket policy uh, signature initiatives it, it, is there a good cooperation between the different nations yeah i mean we have a really really great relationship actually i mean um uh, usefully i worked with a number of them when i was at living streets uh, in fact okay. i actually i helped write the uh, active travel design guidance in wales i wrote the walking chapter uh, on oh, it so, okay. um, so, so, okay. so 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 i knew colleagues pretty well from then and essentially we, we kind of it's established a grouping about five or six years ago now where we meet like four times a year and, and we share our experiences because you know as, as you say you know if Wales is doing something well actually let's learn from what Wales are doing if we're doing something you know Scotland can learn from us and vice versa and in fact there's there's been quite a few sort of uh, programs or schemes where you know we've said look we're thinking about this could you tell us about your experiences you know what would you recommend we do do what would you recommend that we avoid and it just means that actually you get to a, a kind of better outcome uh much quicker o obviously you know sort of um that th there are political differences within the devolved nations so uh within england scotland wales and, and of course northern ireland uh as well um but at the end of the day you know we're just trying to improve active travel and enable more people to walk will and cycle so um uh, that's why we have a good relationship and i know we've had brexit of course but but actually you're, you're very much an active member of the the pep uh, transport health and environment pan european partnership group aren't you as well and so you are interested in that sort of european context or uh, other places around the world aren't you as well you are looking oh oh totally and and, and certainly you know i think the pep is is great and the work that's going on on the expert group on cycling at the unce as well um so certainly those experience really sort of help feedback into what we're doing and equally i then share it with sort of our, our friends over in wales scotland and northern ireland as well right. and also also sort of much further afield as well actually we, we, we regularly sort of have visitors from from around the world who kind of have heard about what we're up to and are keen to sort of hear more about it um and and so once again i i think it's sort of you know this global community we can just learn so much uh you know from each other um and, and not sort of you know try and reinvent the wheel because you know there's only so much time in the day at the end of the day absolutely yeah no you hit a really good point thank you um no we're, we're almost out of time a couple of things i just still want to cover with you firstly was about indicators because it, it seems to me with all this ambition and all all these uh, all that money all, all the staff 100 people you know you've really got three targets one was about increasing walking I think from 41 to 46 percent, um, particularly for short trips, isn't it? You've got a, a walk stages, which you, you want to go from 360 to 365 stages. And then you've got this one around walk to school, 49 percent up to 55 percent. Um, I don't know whether they're ambitious enough, but it, it, they don't seem very detailed to me. There's lots more that other people are committing to in indicators and sort of evaluating things what, what was what's the history around these and do you think there's going to be more detail coming in, in future editions maybe yeah it's, it's a really good question actually i mean we i remember when we developed seawiz one we thought really long and hard about actually how much detail do you go into because you, you could have a whole, as you say a whole suite of indicators uh for for, for different protected characteristics uh yeah. for, for different age groups and so on yeah so target groups well. and road yeah, yeah, safety yeah, yeah. you it. know lots of things um, that you could you could have here yeah yeah, yeah no, that's it um and equally you know you could and i know we discussed this at the pep only last week uh you know how how do you measure it you know is it is it percentage of journeys is it you know journeys is it trips is it stages and there's a whole world of conversation in there in in the end we decided to sort of settle down on on, on stages and we work with a couple of universities on on this as well mainly because what we wanted to do was reflect the importance particularly for walking in the role that it plays in travel from from a to b so of course you know a journey to work might involve three stages so walking to the train station the train journey which might be the longest journey but the longest bit um, of, of that journey and then finally the stage from the train station 
to the workplace. And we felt that actually the best way of drawing out, you know, the import, the strategic importance of walking was actually by using that that stage approach, if you like. Um, we also wanted to include something around walking to school because we'd done quite a lot around walking to school. And whilst we couldn't measure it in stages, just because of a methodological reason, really, to be honest, um, we did have the percentages. And so there we had, you know, the percentage that we've got is that we want 55% of primary school age children walking to school. So that's up to the age of about 11. That's mainly because, uh, particularly in England, I think this is replicated elsewhere, once you get to secondary school, so 11 to 16, you see distances increasing. And so increasingly, um, uh, pupils will tend to use public transport, whether that's a bus or rail or something like that as well. So I, I think moving forward, though, you're right, actually. I, I, I think the, the trick that I've always said is actually segmenting who, um, who are we targeting when we're talking about enabling more walking, wheeling and cycling? And then by identifying different population segments, the interventions that you use meet the needs of those segments. And, and, and so that's something that I've been talking about for years. Um, yeah. I think now that we've got Active Travel England in place, we can start thinking about actually, you know, how are we putting in infrastructure? What does that infrastructure mean for certain groups? Um, how does it enable certain groups to walk, wheel and cycle in a way that wasn't done before? And also on the behavior change side of it, actually, how, how can we enable people to, you know, to, to, to walk perhaps for journeys rather than, you know, driving a mile to school to do a school pickup or a five minute drive or something like that to the school run and actually walk instead. And of course, everyone's different. We're all humans at the end of the day. So, so I think there is a big thing there around sort of segmentation as well. So I think there's so many ways you can dice and slice when go. it comes more to, to come, metrics. More definitely, to definitely. And, and finally, then, just in terms of, you know, you've you've been at this for some years now, you've you've explained um, you've gone from being a, a campaigner to come on the inside and actually help with the development of the policy. And now you're sort of helping oversee with its delivery. Uh, what would be your tips for other countries, maybe those who haven't even started yet or those who've you know, been working hard on a plan, but maybe haven't got the budget, the sort of number, maybe they haven't got the prime minister that you happen to get for a certain moment when your budget suddenly uh, multiplied. A any advice, any any thoughts that, to help other people? Yeah, I, I, I think I always go back to kind of tr tr make friends in, in, in sort of strange places, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> because I, I think so often, you know, for, for colleagues, whether, you know, you're in a, whether you're in a council, whether you're in a government department, you know, you live within your silo, basically. Uh, and, and, and actually, you know, broadly speaking, we're, we're not very good at getting out of silos. But, but the thing that I always try to do is get out and about and sort of make those contacts. So if, if you don't have, you know, a legislative basis for a plan, and you don't have the funding, that isn't to say that you can't be doing work to get you there. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned about, you know, colleagues in education or colleagues working with local government or colleagues working, you know, in sport, you can have those conversations to understand what they're doing. And, and so often you'll discover that actually you're trying to do the same sort of place, sort of thing, sometimes in the same sort of places as well, actually. And just by opening those conversations and having those dialogues, you're just opening up the possibilities. Now, of course, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, political support is really important. Everyone says that. Equally, money helps as well. But I think if you've got those contacts and those relationships, that just gives you a really, really good starting point. No, thank you. And, and actually your statutory instrument, of course, let's not forget that because it's because of that you've got this long term uh commitment that you've got cross party su support to actually deliver kevin thank you so much for your for your generosity and uh, with your time it, it's been a fascinating story i think we could talk for another hour probably but, easily um, <laughs> we you. promised we'd keep these to an hour so i i'm going to stop it at this moment but kevin golding williams on behalf of the uk government particularly in england with active travel england thank you for sharing your story with us today um i'm sure we should do this again more more often and sort of catch up about how active travel is getting on 
uh, across the country and, and within the regions as well. I think it's a fascinating approach to actually create this agency to make sure that there is a delivery uh, of this ambition as, as well as just a good ambition. Uh, we wish you all the best and thank you very much again for your time today. Thank you. Okay, thanks.